Welcome everybody to Decentralized News. I'm Ozzy here with my co-host Piter. We're What's here. Up, yeah, we're here to bring everybody the absolute latest in crypto news and what how it matters to your wallet and to what's going to be happening in the market this week. That being said, this is not financial advice, and we always suggest that you do your own research. If you like the content, like, subscribe, leave a comment, share it with a friend. It really helps us out. As always, we are here to bring you as much as we can, as quickly as we can. And we will also be dropping airdrop guides and other great content on this channel all the time. Follow along if you want to. Now, Piter, what's our first big story this week? We're, we still can't get away from the NFT story just yet. The um, NFT? NFTs. Or, I'm sorry, the, yeah, not, that, that, that's a coming story, the NFTs. The ETFs. Like, I'm a little dyslexic. But anyway, so we had on the 9th the fake drop of the ETFs, the Bitcoin ETFs. Apparently, the own Twitter account got hacked and it was compromised. And whose ex came on and said, yeah, they didn't have two-factor authentication on. So they're, they're telling you how to be safe, but they screwed that up. But anyway, we have a quote right here. The SEC X account was compromised and an unauthorized user post created the post. The SEC has not approved the listing and trading of spot Bitcoin exchange traded products. The very next day on the 10th, they did put out it did launch. Everything came out on the 10th, what was expected. But their statement was interesting. So they said, today the commission approved the listing and trading of a number of spot Bitcoin exchange traded funds. In this letter that he wrote, he specifically talked about Grayscale. So it really does seem to be because of Grayscale. So the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia held that the commission failed to adequately explain its reasoning for disapproving the listing and trading of Grayscale's proposed ETP. The court therefore vacated the grayscale order that they made that they couldn't, you know, do this ETF and, and remanded the matter back to the commission. Based on these circumstances and those discussed more fully in the approval order, I feel the most sustainable path forward is to approve the listing and trading of these spot Bitcoin ETF shares. Okay. And then the other thing I just want to add about this in their letter. So the SEC is not supposed to decide merit. They're just supposed to enforce, right? They're just supposed to create, make people follow the rules. Though, this is their quote, though we're merit neutral, they go on to make comments about it. Bitcoin is prim primarily a speculative volatile asset that is also used for illicit activity, including ransomware, money laundering, sanction evasion, terrorist financing. We approved the listing and trading of the spot Bitcoin ETF shares today, but we did not improve or endorse Bitcoin. So I thought that was interesting to say the least, that they're not supposed to talk about merit, but they go right ahead and do it in their closing statement. Not only that, but one of the commissioners, Cren Commissioner Crenshaw, even published a massive, I think, 13-page statement on dissenting from the decision. Both she and Le Lazargo both voted in, in dissent against the approval. They're both the two Democrats on the... On, in the commission, Gary mm -hmm. Gensler was actually the, the deciding vote and voted in favor. So that's mm -hmm. obviously pretty interesting. He also said that he doesn't believe he doesn't believe that digital assets are safe or anything like that. But he basically he said he was his hands were forced. Crenshaw retorted the standard Democrat line of fraudulent activities, crimes, and all of that. And it, that's interesting to say the least, just to see what, how it divided it was along party lines, even though it really shouldn't be a partisan issue. Especially with a regulatory agency. But that, that's the nature of American politics these days in general. Regulatory bodies are becoming more political, unfortunately. We also had Elizabeth Warren come out strong against it, saying they shouldn't have done it, but it's, they're just following the law. And that's part of what he said is because of the courts and the law, we can't stick our foot in the mud anymore, even though we're just supposed to be, we're not supposed to be merit-based. Basically, they're admitting we have been, but we can't do it anymore. Sorry about that. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting to see that. It was very interesting. And it was so I... dramatic, and they laid it till the 11th hour. The whole thing was 
surreal the way it came down. You know? Yeah. And the approval was insane. Just the hack and then Bitcoin rallied hard. And then within about 15, 15 minutes, the news comes out. Oh, that's it was a hack. And which, then, which essentially wiped out a lot of leverage long and shorts, just wiped everybody out who was near near that price. Yeah, everyone got wiped out on that price. And then basically when the news came out that it was it, it's approved, the He's reaction up. was muted because everybody was like, is this real or not? Were they hacked? And it came out like it originally came out on the SEC website about five minutes before it was supposed to. So they it posted and then it got taken down then it got reposted uh, i didn't even know that so it was it was ridiculous yeah. like it's here and what was it, another interesting part of it was all the alts rallied it was almost like okay now that it actually came down on the 10th it was like a stamp of approval on the market in general and it seemed like all the alts rallied but bitcoin didn't do anything and then went down after that like the next day on friday it was dipping yeah it took a big I think ETH rallying was a super interesting story just in and in of yeah. itself. It shows just how narrative based crypto is right now. And everyone yeah. knew what the next narrative was. Like everyone knew at this point that the Bitcoin ETFs were approved. It, it felt almost inevitable that they were being approved. And mm. so then when you've got Bitcoin, you've got ETH rallying. It, it's got to be the ETH ETF narratives, don't you think? Yeah, and we'll get into that a little bit, but let's just finish talking about the ETF, not the NFT. So we had a couple of days of trading. So we had Thursday and Friday where the Bitcoin ETFs traded. Friday or Saturday, Sunday, and it's Martin Luther King Day in the States. So all the markets are closed. So there won't be any big activity in terms of that today. So it won't start up again until tomorrow when this is posting. But anyway, just keep that in mind when you're looking for activity. After two days of trading... There's inflows and there's cumulative volume. And we're going to break that down a little bit. So there were 7.1 billion in cumulative volume in all of these ETFs. Okay. So the first day of trading generated 4.6 billion in total volume, buys and sells, and 2.5 billion on the next day. BlackRock, which is of the new, not so not counting Grayscale, of the new ETFs crypto-based product led in overall volume with 1 billion in trading on the first day and, and or I'm sorry of the new ones and then grayscale led in overall volume with 2.3 billion on the first day their GBTC fund which had which is primarily com comprised of outflows did shed 95 million altogether so this is the actual between inside that volume it only lost 95 million so inside that 2.3 billion in volume 95 million actually went out the door with GBTC fund. Now the others had volume inflow. So BlackRock, Fidelity, Bitwise, those were the big, three big winners that had inside all of that billions of dollars of volume, we had a gain of 237 million into the Bitwise fund, Fidelity 226 million, and BlackRock 111 million. And then we had some loss in some loss in the GBC fund, GBTC fund, but overall positive and money coming into the system. Yeah. The net outflow out of Grayscale makes some sense. Grayscale has been operating the trust and the for several years now, at least three. And especially in this bear market, there was a really good discount. You could buy Bitcoin at almost a 40% discount in the GBTC yeah. fund. And some people are sitting who bought at that bottom are sitting at a two or three X at the, at least a three X probably, if not more. And so seeing some people take advantage of that and take, take their money does, isn't surprising. You essentially, you were pretty trapped within the GBTC fund overall up until this new ETF. And so to see some net outflows, potentially even just into other ETFs, like that 95 million that was a net outflow doesn't even mark is half the inflow of either Fidelity or Bitwise. So it's not even a, a true net outflow on the overall uh, ETFs. Yeah, I think there was just some expectation of just like this God candle coming and things like that. And it's like TradFi moves a little slower, one. Anyone who was already here 
already had their money in. And then we have GPTC putting some pressure on money coming out. And that will probably unwind. That will probably take a little more time to unwind. Yeah, I, I think people will slowly take their GPTC profits. I feel like, again, I've talked about tax season probably two or three times across either this show or other shows, either with 100X or on this channel. Tax season is going to be interesting this year. I think some people will be looking at strategic moves within their tax tax accounts on how to uh, properly structure their their holdings for Bitcoin and crypto. And so I think that could be another major factor. Like we might see some GPTC outflows over the next three months, basically heading into March and tax yeah, season. I don't know about you, but my general feeling is over the long term, especially going into having it is incredibly bullish it unlocks a lot of capital but there are some headwinds we have an election year here which can be volatile we have the fed pivot while on the surface is bullish typically they pivot because something is wrong so it's when they initially start to cut rates it's not necessarily the bullish moment it's because something is going wrong with the economy so we have that so there are a couple of little headwinds and we've had just a major run up for a while so blowing off some steam from that. Uh, I know we talk a little bit on the side about a little bit of technical analysis and we have like an eight week moving average that we're testing right now. And a lot of times when it tests this eight week moving average and it breaks through, it can go down to the 20 week moving average, which is right around 36,000. So just some numbers to keep, keep an eye on. If it does continue to go down, it could test that. And if it doesn't go below, we're still technically in the bull market in the TA sense, in the technical analysis. Yeah, in a, in a TA sense, tomorrow's video dropping after our news video is all about is now the right time to buy Bitcoin? And I, yeah, I that's a brave topic to take on. <laughs> it's a brave topic to take on, and I, I talk about it. It I talk about it in a couple of senses, both personally where you are in your personal finances and a little bit of this Bitcoin TA, not heavy on TA because I don't feel like everyone needs to know Astro all of the Bitcoin. For men. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> TA is not an exact science. And no. really, if anyone could predict the future, like if I could predict the future on Bitcoin price, I would be a millionaire i wouldn't be we wouldn't be making this stuff we would just be being paid billions of dollars by blackrock to predict exactly what's happening on, on the price of anything so yeah. so but those are definitely levels to watch out for and there's a lot of things going on in this market that we've got to keep an eye on i think definitely some of the headwinds especially with a pivot which we'll talk about in the macro section in a little bit and just all of the rally that we've had up until now does pose a little bit of a headwind for Bitcoin maybe pushing 50k this in the next month or two. But it's really hard to predict. This thing could just break out. You just never know. Every cycle is a little different and they, it rhymes, but it doesn't follow exactly. And in fact, it never really follows exactly. So it's very hard to predict. So you're brave to take that on. But finishing up with the ETF news, Robinhood listed all the BTC ETFs. So even if you're, I don't know, I guess Robinhood is more for the everyday person. They're available for everybody to get involved in if you want to get involved with the, the ETFs. Um, but in terms of people with money, we had Vanguard. They made some waves by blocking clients from buying Bitcoin. Did you see this? Yeah, I, I saw it all over Twitter. Everyone's like, oh, I guess I'm leaving Vanguard. You can't buy it. Yeah, there's that. There's some people who just, don't even care. I'll test the waters and I'll ask my dad. I mean, he's retired, right? Like done. I'm like, did you hear about the Bitcoin ETF? He's like, no. Like, yeah. Not at all. You, then, you've got to be like, paying attention know, to the about. space. Like ETFs have to, the, the spot ETFs had to have been on your, in your scope of view or you CNBC and some of the, and Fox business, for example, I've been giving the spot ETFs a fair amount of coverage lately. So if you sure. watch those enough, and care enough to pay attention to them, then that the this approval might have also caught your eye as well. But especially for people retired, they're they made it, right? Yeah. Unless their financial advisors say we're doing this, they're not doing it. If you have Vanguard, which assets under management, seven point two trillion. That's a lot of money. Mm 
<laughs> and they're saying like, no, nah, we don't do that. You know what I mean? But the, in, in their defense, a little bit, they don't do gold either. So it's just, they don't do that kind of asset. But still, that's a lot. That's a lot of assets under management. Then you also have Bank of America owned Merrill Lynch limiting access. This is an evolving story, but basically to high net worth individuals, it may be they're the only ones who are allowed to access it, which I thought was interesting. It's like only the rich are allowed to access it. It doesn't I, sound good on the surface. It, it feels counter Bitcoin and the ethos yeah. of decentralization. I get potentially where they're going in terms of just how much volatility Bitcoin could add to a portfolio. And so people that are of maybe lower net worth, that could have a, a larger impact on their overall portfolio and, Maybe a lot of financial advisors aren't well versed on Bitcoin or the spot ETFs. And so they don't, they aren't in a position to properly advise their clients. I think that's maybe showing a weakness on the side of Merrill Lynch and Vanguard and those advisors who don't have that proper education on spot ETFs. And there is that education out there. DAC FP, the Digital Assets for Financial Planners Council does a lot of education in the U S all around that. So worth, if you're a financial advisor, worth checking that out and following some of their courses. Continuing on the TradFi element or just this sign of stamp of approval from TradFi, which there's an irony to this because that's why Bitcoin was developed. It doesn't need it necessarily, but the whole con the whole community was excited to get it. <laughs> I found that a bit ironic, but anyway, Circle, which is a stable coin, when they issue USDC, has filed for an IPO. So just a sign of continued TradFi adoption. Circle Internet Financial, the company behind the stable coin, said on Thursday that it has confidently, throw that in there, quote unquote, filed for a US initial public offering as part of his plan to become an initial, a publicly traded company. They haven't disclosed the number of shares or the price range. The company had previously set its value at $9 billion in a 2022 deal to go public, but that fell through in December 2022. USDC is the second biggest stablecoin after Tether, which gets never-ending FUD, it seems like, and the seventh biggest cryptocurrency overall. Tokens are backed by cash and cash equivalents, including short-term treasury bonds, and there are about $25 billion worth of USDC out there in circulation. So, not worth noting that story. Definitely worth noting, I think, IPO can have an impact on how they conduct business, but it also shows it's the second crypto company that's IPOing. We had Coinbase, and Coinbase has outperformed Bitcoin overall. They had a pretty bad dump down to thirty or forty dollars. Yeah, not from the IPO, but yeah, I think from its bottom. It IPO'd during yeah. the bull market, so it dumped yeah, just yeah, as yeah. hard, if not harder than Bitcoin, and then has rallied just as hard, if not harder than Bitcoin. It hit a 30 or $40 low and it's now trading, I think somewhere around $120 last I saw, but it could be. It's over, it's, I think it's over its IPO. Is it over its IPO now? That's I okay. So. I think so. So even better. So that's even more because I think the IPO was somewhere around $200. So oh, okay. no. it def so it looks like it's, perform like it's performing relatively well. It's IPO maybe not was at the perfect date, but if you look at Circle, Circle might be IPOing at a better time, bull market coming and everything like that. You might be able to get capture much more of a rally with the Circle IPO than you were with like the initial Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. Like, so something to watch for sure. I think that's yeah. super interesting. And whether we see something like Ripple or another crypto company, maybe MakerDAO, I don't think MakerDAO would do it, but maybe Uniswap go for, for something like that could be interesting. Yeah, that'd be, that would be more IPOs, but I think we will see more one by one. I have, I was trying to get a sense for how long this would take. I couldn't really, couldn't really get a sense, but it basically goes to the Securities and Exchange Commission. So they're back in the news and they, they've got something else in the news too, in terms of ETH. We've got the ETH ETFs and... Yeah. Those deadlines are a lot closer than I imagined. With yeah, ETH is important because it really does seem to be the next big narrative. So we had the approval, big deal. And now we have this ETH, ETH narrative unfolding. And there's multiple catalysts pushing it forward. One of them being ETH, yeah. Yeah. 
It's absolutely nuts. The ETFs, if we look at the deadlines, the first final deadline's in May, May 23rd. And Ooh. that's the ARK ETF. They are always in the front, aren't they? They're always in the front. And They're pushing it. <laughs> I them. feel like, I don't know about you, but May feels too early for me. I'm looking more late summer, early fall in terms of a potential approval date. We've got a lot of first deadlines coming up in the latter half of January. It right. seems like in terms of the May 23rd, like they have, there's more gray area, more maybe not the court precedent reasons to de actually deny them. Yeah, there's a lot more reasoning to potentially deny the ARC ETF for... We're with the Bitcoin when we had precedent that says they can't deny this anymore. And that's why everyone was so excited it was going to happen. Yeah, people are, are still seem to be excited about the ETH ETF. ETH yeah, held up sure. pretty well and rallied a few hundred dollars uh, after the Bitcoin ETF announcement. But it does feel, at least in most circles or a lot of people that have talked about, there's a bit more of a muted response. It, the ARC ETF just might actually get denied. It might be our grayscale moment of the for the ETH ETF, in my well, mind. And the other thing to keep in mind is iShares, which is BlackRock, they also have an application in. And just the reason I mention them is just their record is so strong. They've only had one, one denied in their history. Now, the one that was denied, it was maybe similar in the sense that they were denying all things like that 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 type of product so this could apply it could be that type of thing like we're denying everything that's eth right now but yeah we'll see it's definitely a, a narrative that i think we'll see a lot of this year but beyond that in terms of eth there there's some other things we have the you pronounce it better the decon the the decon went onto the Gorley test net so decon is the I'd say it's not the final, it's the final major upgrade to ETH, but it's one of the final major upgrades to ETH. It's supposed to make L2s even more affordable and mm. make ETH, just take ETH to the next level for, right. so that we really the have... Evolution. Yeah. It's the next level in ETH evolution with protodank charting. It's supposed to come sometime March, April is the time frame. They're right now in the Gorley test net, which is one of the first testing grounds. They usually have about five testing grounds where they're testing these upgrades before they go onto ETH mainnet. And that's super interesting and something to watch out for. This could be a major, once this goes out, it could be a major drive because I think we'll start seeing the L2 explosion continue. We're already seeing that L2 explosion happen. I dropped a video on Friday about Manta. They're having an airdrop. We've got Blast, which is having an airdrop in May. We had Arbitrum Optimism. We've got ZK Sync. We've got Mantle. We have Scroll. We've got Linea. That's almost, that's 10 on just my, off the top of my head. And I'll be dropping a lot of airdrop guides for many of these because most of these will be dropping airdrops at some point in the next year. It's little bit yeah basically we have the ETH ETF we have the test net launching there's a continued development we have the layer twos which is somewhat connected to that and just lots of airdrops coming on the air twos more development isn't there airdrops on these networks that had airdrops like OP and Arbitrum OP is doing more of a granting program so OP mm -hmm. is doing a granting program for projects that were building on the OP stack and building the OP uh, retroactively so it's like program like they built something and now you're getting a bit of a grant and a stipend and a, and a reward for doing it mm -hmm. arb is also working on a grant program as well so that's they, they're working on meme coins too over there they're, they're, they're them and it avalanche <laughs> it seems so yeah. super super interesting with that. Be with Solana. yeah oh that's it um, I, it's pretty interesting and if if you like this kind of content, please give us a like, subscribe. We're, we work really hard to find all of this, these stories. Piter spends basically the better part of a day trying to type, find all these stories and bring you guys all of the latest that's going on. I we think about it all the time, dude. I, like, I sit down for a day, but yeah, I'm always thinking about this. But there's one other big one, the ETH restaking narrative. As far as like these, this unfolding ETH narrative, before you do the like and subscribe thing.
we have the ETH restaking narrative, which I think we could see explode. So in essence, restaking allows users to carry out the same ETH stake on Ethereum and then on other protocols. And this functions to maintain the security of all these networks simultaneously and utilize the existing trust network. And then by leveraging these Ethereum validators and stake tokens, smaller and newer blockchains can benefit from Ethereum security and just reduce the risk of attacks and failure for these like burgeoning systems. On, and on January 10th, or I'm sorry, not on January 10th, but CoinGecko recently, I don't know exactly, they recently opened up a restaking category. And on January 10th, the DeFi researcher Igna stated, I believe this will be the fastest growing category in 2024. On the CoinGecko, the market capitalization is currently 300 million. I just want to throw a couple of names out there because there's not too many yet. Pendle Finance is one of the biggest. You have Picasso, Restake Finance, Egen Layer. I think you'll start to hear more and more about them. I think they have Egen Layer. I dropped a whole airdrop farming guide on the channel all about farming their airdrop. And then there's also EtherFi, which might not be on that list, but they're also in taking advantage of Egen Layer and that restaking narrative to really capitalize on it. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space i think we'll be talking about restaking and the agen layer airdrop and everything for a while to come i think it's going to be massive because it makes being an eth validator even more lucrative and more interesting i will probably as we get some more details on agen layer and it's got more time to perform i'll be dropping a passive income with agen layer video because it makes ETH validators an even more interesting passive income play if you want to retire early and want to be able to essentially fund your income and fund your lifestyle with ETH staking rewards. Yeah, ETH, ETH is, could be an opportunity, not financial advice. And then there's one last thing on ETH before we close this down. And you mentioned it last week, but there is the disinflationary aspects of ETH and also just the percentage of ETH on exchanges is going down faster than Bitcoin. So people always talk about Bitcoin and how little is on exchanges, although that may change with this ETF thing going on. But ETH right now is like slightly deflationary and it can, that can speed up depending on how things go. It depends on how much the network is being used. It can be inflationary or deflationary, but it still has the potential to be deflationary and it currently is. ETH on exchanges is going down uh, incredible levels you know what i mean there's a lot to get excited about with it yeah and, a lot, uh, yeah a lot of ETH is and moving onto the chains and onto these l2s to be able to start doing transactions and start really performing with the network and so i think people are just seeing the opportunity that lies in airdrops and lies in these l2 chains for eth and there's no need to hold eth on exchange anymore especially with these li liquid staking providers that allow you to just it's potentially safer to stake your ETH on these liquid staking providers than it is to stake your ETH on a centralized exchange. And I think, and more lucrative too. So I think that's just incredible to see that movement on chain. If you if you enjoy the content and you like the little tidbits of alpha we bring you, please do like and subscribe. Moving on, we had Optimism and like you said, their grant program. They're doing a round three of grants. So continue to growing and a hundred million being granted to different projects. And then we had Vitalik coming out, encouraging other projects to do the same. So we might see more of this. And then Arbitrum DAO is doing a vote on exactly this. Yeah, I think we're going to be seeing L2s encouraging DAP development on L2s. I think this is a major step in the L2 narrative of seeing DAPs not build on ETH, but built on these L2s so that we they can A, get these stipends, and B, it takes that traffic and being able to in interact with these protocols away from needing to be done on ETH's crazy gas fees and onto these L2s where it's cheaper and more user accessible. And I think that is super, super impressive and important for the ETH evolution that Vitalik wants to see. And then we have Osmosis also getting into it. They have announced a staking version one upgrade uh, for their UI. Users can now stake directly on Osmosis with the goal to simplify the staking process for Cosmos assets. There's a lot of building going on in Cosmos. Cosmos so is a lot of building, a lot of airdrops. I dropped an airdrop guide for Cosmos and Cosmos already has a pretty accessible staking 
mechanism compared to ETH and the fact that Osmosis is trying to make it even easier, that's incredible. I think ease of use will continue to be a big narrative in 2024. Another little story we have, uh, native swaps between BTC, Bitcoin, ETH, and Polkadot now available on Chainflip. So Dot not wanting to be forgotten about. Yeah, they're, they're also involved with Matic, with the Man- Manta. And so this is pretty, with Manta Atlantic. So this is interesting to see just how much their Polkadot is trying to get back in that conversation. They had, they'd essentially disappeared from the conversation and they're poking their head back up now. They seem to be coming they're out of high- a different way. And yeah, some of the narratives, it's almost like they have to create their own narrative. <laughs> yeah. Like these other narratives seem to include a lot of the, Ethereum ecosystem, EVM chains, but it's almost like Dot, Ada, even Solana, they create their own narratives. Absolutely. Anyway, we can get into the macro a little bit. It was an interesting week as far as that goes. Yeah, it was a super interesting week. If we look at data, we'll start there because I think this week had really interesting data. CPI, both month over month and year over year, came in hot. About a 0.1% percent above expected on both those numbers which is not great considering everyone was wanting to see it continue down the trajectory towards two percent we had yeah, two soft. where's our soft landing yeah everyone was hoping we were getting that soft landing even though there was some concern about unemployment numbers we were it was looking like we might get that soft landing but now everyone's worrying is inflation like accelerating again are we seeing a, a re-acceleration of inflation because we did see cpi and ppi both tick up in important categories that raise some concern i think that will be something to watch and especially as we well, look at you... both the what's going to happen with interest rates do you want to give us a little bit of well, take on that i mean sure i was just surprised by it so seeing these CPI numbers come in and it was a mixed bag with the unemployment numbers. It was like, oh, there may be cracks. There was one way to look at it where it was like, oh, there's some real problems here. And then there was other numbers that were like, oh, everything's fine. So it was a little bit of a mixed bag as far as unemployment goes. And then CPI comes in hot and I expect seeing that I expected the rate cut to maybe get pushed out a little bit, but it's gotten the expectation is higher there's going to be a rate cut. So this next meeting, end of the month, no cut. That hasn't changed. That's like 95%. But 75% chance at the next meeting that there's a cut and over 100% that the meeting after that, that the cuts will have started. That surprised me a little bit, especially with the CPI print coming in hot. And it just made me think, what am I missing here? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what we're missing. Maybe forecasters are just thinking, are reading more into the unemployment numbers. I've got to dive into housing numbers this week. I want to double check, see if maybe there's something bad with the housing numbers, but it's winter. It's the cooler season. So I expect housing numbers to be a bit low. It's super interesting. and super odd to see, you know, the market hold on so tightly to these potential cuts. I just, it, it boggles my mind, especially when they used to be so reactionary to that CPI right. number. We did not see a strong reaction to the CPI number. In, it, it, it reacted against what I expected. Yeah, it was wild. Yeah, so interesting. There's not a lot of huge numbers coming out the rest of this week. We're waiting on PC that's going to come out before the next meeting. But other than that, nothing crazy important in terms of data. And I'll be, we'll have to see how expectations change and if maybe any speeches or, or talks will flip the market at all but doesn't seem likely based on how they reaffirm their stance after the CPI numbers. We have time to do uh, kind of little news and notes. Yeah, let's do it. Juniper's first up, they have a token launch. It'll happen in just two weeks. I expect it to have a major positive impact on the it was Solana, right? Yeah, it's Solana. Jupiter's a big airdrop on Solana. I know a lot of people have been farming it. I personally didn't. It's in that DEX aggregator space and... So it's interesting to see that they're taking off. Attention to the system. And then you have another airdrop with Camino. 
Yeah, so Camino Finance is a lending and borrowing platform. I have been farming that one alongside MarginFi. And so that's super interesting to see. There. So you already started farming, but the points start next week? Yeah, p- points only start next week. I had been... I've been waiting for their point system to get in. And so I wanted to, I pre-filled my allocation in there, try to set myself up to make the most I can out of this potential market. I see the people talking about the Camino one. Seems some excitement around that one. Yeah, I'll probably drop a little Solana video in the next couple of weeks talking about Camino and some of the other ones, not Jupiter, but probably Jupiter round two and, and everything else that's going on in that space. Because there are quite a few airdrops to be farmed there. Yeah, I, actually, I sent you one today. It was like a Bitcoin drop, or on the Bitcoin. It was like Satoshi. Yeah, it's games, that one's. VM. It's interesting. That one was originally there was an IDO or an ICO recently. As oh. well, it, I mean, it drops everywhere. I was surprised to see one on the BTC chain. Yeah, it's super interesting. There's a lot. Everybody is doing airdrops this year, and so if you want to keep up with that, please follow the channel where i'm going to be dropping as much as i can on these and potentially we're i'm exploring booting up a discord where i can drop some of that alpha before i can even make a video about it so keep your eye out for that stuff tia too is up there right covered that in our cosmos airdrop guide tons of airdrops coming to them dym dimension is the first one i'm getting 300 plus tokens from that just on one wallet I know a lot of people that are getting a lot more and there's a whole bunch. I know of at least 10 airdrops coming to Celestia stakers in 2024. If you're not staking Celestia or staking the Cosmos ecosystem at all, go check out the Cosmos guide on the channel. It is definitely worth checking out. I'll have the link to the video up in the cards above. And yeah, those are the major ones. There's probably other stuff that we're missing. We're always, there's always new stories but that's wraps it up for this week unless Pyder, you've got anything else that you think is worth mentioning there's just two more i'm just going to go through them hedera approves 408 million h bar for ecosystem growth so reminds me of op and arbitrum and then this was a fun little story so ninja alerts has they they were do stuff with ordinals and they have inscribed a super nintendo entertainment system emulator onto the bitcoin network enabling users to play games in their browser across ordinal explorers i am not involved in ordinal but i was just i'm not even sure what i'm reading but this looks really interesting but in a tweet from the ninja alerts exxon alpha basically he was saying are you ready to play super nintendo on bitcoin and that's just, essentially what they're doing an emulator that, allows you to play the games like, like on a different device than the SNES, the than the SNES and you get to play right. these really cool. the SNES the SNES games were only like 4 gigs or 8 gigs so easily held mm-hmm. within a block so you could basically with the emulator you can play all of those different games as cuz they updated the ordinal they uploaded it as an ordinal so that's pretty cool anyway that that wraps it up but not financial advice me and Ozzy are not financial advisors please do your own research and be careful out there If you enjoy the content, please do like and subscribe. We appreciate it more than we just want to bring you genuine content that just fosters conversations and helps the market grow. That's all we're here to do. And thanks for listening. Yeah, we really appreciate it. We also appreciate everyone that subscribed in the last couple of weeks. We broke 200 subscribers, which really means a lot to us. We've been going at this for over a year. And yeah, so a major thank you for all of that from everyone who's liked, subscribed, or shared a video over the last year. It's made a, it's really meant a lot to us. So thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you guys next week.